Hello everybody and welcome to the United Stand. I'm joined by Fabrizio Romano. Fabrizio, thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you. Always a pleasure to be here. Yes, and let's get straight into it because there was some news coming out this morning that I saw just before we're about to go on the show. And it was coming out from what I saw from Arnstein about Adrian Rabio from Juventus. And he said MUSC must decide if they proceed irrespective of ongoing for Dion pursuit or await outcome of that before deciding. 27-year-old France midfielder has one year on Juve contract. So I was just wondering to you, is, is the truth in that? Are Manchester United looking at Rabio and how... How much have they progressed with that deal? Yes, of course. And uh, David is a top journalist, so obviously, when when he's saying something, is always true. And in this case, is is absolutely true that Manchester United have an interest in in Adrian Rabiot. It's a possibility. It's something that they are already discussing with Juventus. So there is already a direct conversation between Manchester United and Juventus on, on Adrian Rabiot. Uh, it's a conversation that started last week because we know that Manchester United have some options for the midfield. Uh, it, we will see what happens with Frankie, but they are already working also on, on other players with different skills because Rabiot is a different kind of player. But at the moment, the real point is on player side. We have to see what happens on player side because Adrian Rabiot, when he made some decision on his future uh, in the past, for example, what happened with Juventus, what happened also with Paris Saint-Germain, has never been so easy with his mother as agent because they always want to take care of every single decision and so they want to take their time to decide the future of the player. Uh, Champions League football is something that has always been important for Adrien Rabiot. And so let's see what he will decide. Uh, I'm told that there is a conversation uh, also on player side, Manchester United and player side, to understand his idea, his plans and what he wants to do. And so we will see. I think it will be an important week for this deal because Juventus and Man United have no problem. He's a player available on the market for Juventus. Juventus are prepared to let him go since a long time. So Rabiot is a player that Juve would sell. But the problem is now on player side. Let's see what happens. But for Man United, it is a new option for sure. Yeah, that's a problem, isn't it? No one wants to come to us and they probably won't want to after watching us yesterday as well. But um, yeah, thank you for that update on there. And there's another player as well that's I mean, this news has been ongoing now for quite a few weeks, and it is Benjamin Sesco from Salzburg. And we've heard stuff come out that this week will be an important week, he's going to decide his future. And then we've had conflicting reports saying he wants to stay at Salzburg for another year. Have you got any updates on that? And how likely is, is that deal going to happen? We've heard Chelsea and United are both in the race. Who's closer to that deal? And, and, and is he close to making a decision on that? Yes, it's not as an easy situation because of Red Bull Group. Red Bull Group are always super strong on their talents and Benjamin Sesco is one of the best talents they have in the world group. And so what happened? That last week they had many meetings to decide on the situation because the original plan of Red Bull Salzburg was to sell a player next summer, summer 2023, and not this summer. But then many top clubs started to arrive. May United more than two meetings with his agent Elvis Bazanovic, and then Chelsea also met, uh, met with his agent last Sunday. So they had many meetings with the agent to understand the player's plan. Uh, also, Red Bull Leipzig had a meeting last weekend with, uh, with the agent of the player. So many conversations on player side, but still waiting for Salzburg. And then what happened? Then told that yesterday the message of Salzburg to his agent was pretty clear. Uh, at the moment, they have intention to, to keep the player for one more season. They don't want to negotiate for this summer. So I think it's going to be a difficult one. May United or any other club will need a really important bid if they want to change uh, Red Bull's uh, Salzburg position. Because at the moment, they want to keep the player. They hope to keep Cisco for one more season. And the only thing they would accept is to sell the player for next summer. So to sell him now and keep the player on loan. So this could be a solution. But at the moment, let's see if top clubs like Man United, Chelsea or any other would accept that kind of solution because you're signing a player and then he's not yours for one season. So mm -hmm. it's not an easy one to accept. This week, there will be a meeting between the agent and the player to decide what they want to do and then to meet with Red Bull Salzburg. So I think this week we will have a final uh, decision on this Benjamin Sesco situation. Yeah, hopefully it's a positive one for us. I mean, it, it, it's one of them where Manchester United need players now and waiting a, a year. I don't think that would be the best, but for a talent like that, you'd, you'd kind of have to accept it. And moving on to another striker position, Arn Altovic, a lot of Manchester United fans weren't really very happy when these reports came out about bids being put in and being rejected. And I was just wondering to you, how, how likely is this still to happen? Is it true that Ten Hag sees him as that quick solution to what is a problem that we've got up front? 
And Bologna at the moment insists they don't want to sell the player. So uh, May United this summer are always finding clubs that don't want to send their players. But Marco Arnautovic for Bologna is more than one player. He's a really key figure in the dressing room. He's a really important leader. And so they don't want to lose uh, Marco Arnautovic. But I'm also told that the player would dream joining Manchester United. So he's prepared to push and push again in case May United will be back with a new bid. Because this is the real point now. To understand if May United want to go uh, for a new proposal for more than seven, eight million pounds. Because the opening one was around seven, eight million pounds. And Bologna said, no, they want more than this. Uh, for a player that is not so young uh, and maybe is not the superstar that May United fans were expecting. And so so we will see if Man United will decide to bid the game for Mark Arnautovic. But on player side, he's ready to push and insist again to join Man United. So it's up to the club, I feel, in this case. But Bologna want more than 10, 11 million euros for, uh, for Arnautovic. So it's not going to be an easy negotiation, this one. Let me say this is surprising. Honestly, surprising. When we reported the news yesterday on Sky Italy, Honestly, we're not expecting May United to go for Mark Arnautovic. We said many and many and many times that May United were looking for a striker in February, in March, in April, also here together. And we were not expecting to arrive in August and discuss of Mark Arnautovic. Very good player, but we were not expecting that kind of negotiation. Was it Ten Hag who pushed for Arnautovic? Was it him that kind of spotted him as, as a solution? Or was it Manchester United that kind of went forward with that deal? Yes, one of the solutions that he considered, let me say, not the only one, because it's also true that May United tried to enter into races like Darwin Nunez and other potential negotiations. So, of course, Arnautovic was not the super priority, but one of the players that they that they considered because of Eric Tenag, he knew him since 20, and same with Steve McLaren, so they know the player very well. And he's a quality striker. He did very well last, um, last season in, in, in Serie A with Bologna. So... He's a good player, but the expectation was different, honestly. So let's see if May United now will decide to pay more than seven, eight million pounds for Mark Arnautovic. That would be surprising, but transfer market, everything can happen. We are desperate, so we'll have to wait and see. And moving on to another player, which is Cody Gakpo of PSV. Um, we got linked to him. Apparently, Eric Ten Hag really likes the player. Is there any truth in that? Are we following a pursuit for him, or is it just one of them names that's being thrown about at the moment? I'm told that he's one of the players that they considered in many internal meetings with Eric Ten Hag because he knows the player so well. He's one of the stars in the Eredivisie, a very good player, talented player. But at the moment for him, for Cody Gakpo, it's really important to focus on the uh, preliminary game of Champions League with um, with PSV and Doven. So at the moment, they are not negotiating for Gakpo because he wants to take his time and he wants to focus on, on Champions League football with PSV and then to decide his future. So let's see. I think it will take some time uh, on Gakpo's side to understand his future. Uh, of course, the link with Eric Ten Hag is immediate as he's a kind of Dutch-style player. But at the moment, we need to wait a bit and see on this one because there are many clubs interested. For example, he was in the list of Leeds before they signed Sinisterra. Arsenal have been scouting him for a long time. But at the moment, still nothing advanced. So PSV insists that they have no bid on the table for Gatti. Yeah, um, I, I assume that would be the news. And obviously, Anthony was someone that we were linked to a lot. And then it kind of cooled off because Manchester United didn't want to pay the price. Talks of apparently going for Leroy Sane as a replacement. I assume that is... It isn't true, but we'll get your response on that. And is there any chance at all that Anthony still happens or is the price just way too high for Manchester United? I would keep the situation always open for uh, for Anthony, but this game is getting really difficult. It's really difficult because I don't see Ajax accepting uh, 60 million euros, 70 million euros. So Man United wanted to do the deal for that kind of budget. So their plan this summer was to go for players like Darwin and Anthony for maybe 65, 70 million euros, no more than this. But then Liverpool signed Darwin for more than 100 million euros, I don't include it. And for Anthony, I don't see Ajax accepting that kind of bid. They want way more than this, uh, 80, 85, uh, and maybe with some bonus and the don'ts included. So it's not an easy one. The player would love to join Premier League football in general, and in this case, Man United, but at the moment it's still not something close with uh, with Ajax. But let's keep it open because we never know what happens in the final days of the of the window. And um, the other name was Hassane. He's a player that has always been appreciated by Man United. You know so well that he's always been considered a player in the list. But I think Salihamidzic yesterday, the director of Bayern, was pretty clear. And this is the reality because they, they lost Robert Lewandowski. So they're expecting 
expect in many goals from players like Coman, Yambri, and Sané too, a part, of course, of Sadio Mane. And so this is why, at the moment, for Sané, it's not an easy negotiation. Bayern not intention to let him go. And so May United will need a really important proposal to go for Sané. And at the moment, it's not something happening. So let's see, maybe if they will decide to enter into it, but at the moment, no. Yeah, and um, moving on to De Jong, uh, a story that we spoke about so many times on, on the show, but it's we keep hearing different information, different versions of the same information each week. And I think we just want a bit of clarity on the situation now the transfer window is, is progressing to its final stages. And do you, think, do you think De Jong will end up leaving Barca? And De Jong's consistently saying he still wants to stay and Chelsea apparently confident that they can sign him, Chelsea being an option. Only three weeks left of the window now. Do you think United have any alternatives to De Jong? And also... How likely do you see that deal is happening? Would would you expect him to go to Chelsea, Manchester United or stay at Barcelona? I feel that also during the weekend, the player position was really clear. He still wants to stay at Barcelona. He's <laughs> insisting to stay at Barca. So it's really a complicated story because Frankie wants to stay at Barcelona. And as I said here many times, the problem is, is the player because between clubs, Barcelona are prepared to let him go. There is an agreement between Barcelona and Man United. It's everything ready. So if tomorrow morning Frankie would say, OK, I'm ready to go, then for Man United, the point will be to compete with Chelsea now because two months ago Chelsea were not in the race for Frankie de Jong so in June for example they were not in the race now they are considering Frankie de Jong one of the options for the midfield in case he will change his mind the strategy is different because May United have an agreement ready with Barcelona 75 million euros plus 10 in add-ons Chelsea will enter into it only in case Frankie will give the green light to the potential move so there are different strategies, but at the moment, they started, those strategies are not activated because of Frankie. Frankie still wants to stay at Barcelona. So my feeling is, till the end, May United will try, and till the end, Chelsea will try to enter into it. But at the moment, on Frankie's side, it's still a no. Let's see what happens this week in the conversations with Barcelona, because for Barca, it's really important to find a solution with Frankie. Uh, sell him or salary cut, but Frankie doesn't want to take a salary cut. So <laughs> it's a really crazy story, but I think we have to follow the coming days and see what happens. I was going to say, can Barcelona actually afford to keep him? Because obviously, they need to sign all these players on to the league. Can they afford to, to, to have him stay there? Honestly, on this is, is financial question, and I don't know so well because uh, you know, for example, with Barcelona, many people say hey, it's impossible they're going to do that, and then they did with Rafinha, with Kunde, with Lewandowski, with Ferran Torres in January. So they always did this kind of miracles on the financial point of view. So I really don't know if they can afford it, but of course, for example, they want Bernardo Silva, and signing Bernardo Silva. Uh, to sign Bernardo Silva, they need to sell Frankie de Jong. So this is an important point of their market. This is why the situation is still open, but Frankie insists that he doesn't want to start so to, to leave Barca. So that's it. Yeah, hopefully we'll get some positive news on that. We might need to actually start winning some games for him to convince him to come. But <laughs> moving on to Ronaldo, player that came on yesterday for Manchester United, started on the bench. Everyone was, we didn't know if it was for fitness reasons or other reasons I assume it is for fitness reasons even though he is a very um keeps himself very physically fit and he looks like he's he, he was committed to playing for Manchester United yesterday and we heard the rumors he what well the truth that he wanted to leave he wants to go to Champions League clubs what is the latest on Ronaldo's situation does it look likely he's going to stay or will he be pushing that move all the way up until the deadline day so his agent, Jorge Mendes, is still working to find a solution. This is an important uh, important point. Mendes will try till the end to find a solution. Uh, I still remember last summer between Ronaldo and Juventus was really similar to what's happening between Ronaldo and United this summer. So they try to find a way. And at the same time, Cristiano is a top professional. Uh, I'm told that he's really training at the best level, but also he's really positive in the, in the dressing room with the teammates. The energy between Cristiano and teammates is really positive. Of course, he's ambitious. And so he's not happy when you lose games, for example, as happened yesterday with Brighton or the kind of, of situations. But at the same point, Cristiano is a top professional and he's working at an incredible level. But Jorge Mendes is trying to find a solution. It's not an easy one, you know, because as we said here many times, uh, Chelsea said no because of Thomas Tuchel. Let's see if he will change his mind. But as of now, it's a no for Chelsea. It's up to Tuchel eh? because Todd Bolli 
would appreciate that kind of signing with Cristiano Ronaldo. But for Tuchel, it's a no. For Bayern, they said many times in public that their strategy is different and they're not going to sign a striker. Uh, also, other clubs around Europe, many rumors on Italian clubs like Napoli and that kind of clubs. But I'm told there is nothing, nothing with Italian clubs at the moment and it's impossible for them to afford the salary of Cristiano. So it would take a big salary cut, but Cristiano at the moment is not on the same page. So everything is complicated at the moment to find solutions. But Jorge Mendes is one of the best agents in the world and he will try till the end. If not, Cristiano would be ready to stay and to be a top professional at Man United. So I think it's just a matter of time to understand what happens with, with Cristiano Ronaldo. But let me mention that yesterday he didn't start because of the physical condition. So if they wanted to keep Cristiano out because of the situation of the, of the transfer market and everything, he was not even in the in the in the team, in the squad, and he was not entering in the second half. So it's not because of the transfer market reasons. Yeah, that's good to know because obviously as United fans, you don't want any like any drama behind the scenes. You want everyone focused on what is, is going on on the pitch. And I think, like you said, he is a top professional. And if he, he is playing for us, he's always going to do that at his best. And that's the good thing that you get with Ronaldo. He's he When he it comes to football, he is the top professional. And Chelsea... Um, we kind of in a lot of different in for a lot of different players like linked to Chelsea this window for Manchester United and Dumfries recently linked to Chelsea. Apparently Chelsea want to try and get him, and he seemed seemingly was an Eric Ten Hag target. Is there any update on what can happen with Dumfries? And Manchester United leaving the right back situation because of being able to sell, unable to sell, and uh, Chelsea going in for that deal. I'm curious to see what happens after a Spiliqueta new contract for Chelsea, honestly, if they really want to sign uh, a right back again or not. So this is a good question, I think, because they invested a lot of money on, on Kukureya. And so it's important to understand what they want to do with the, with the right back. But at the moment, it's quiet. Inter insists they have no bid on the table for Denzel Dumfries. They are aware of Chelsea interest, but no bid on the table from Chelsea. And for Man United, it's the same. They know that it's appreciated by Eric Ten Hag. But there is no bid on the table from Man United. And Dumfries is a really important player for Inter. Eh? So I'm not sure that they're going to accept normal proposals for Dumfries at the end of August because they need to find a replacement. He's a starter for Inter. The pre-season for Inter was not an easy one. Uh, they already lost Ivan Perisic, who was a starter uh, in a, as, a, as a winger for, for Inter. And so he's not going to be... A an easy one, I think, for uh, for Chelsea and for Man United. If they want to move, they have to be fast because Inter will need to find a replacement and they will need to offer important money because I don't see Inter selling for less than 30, 35 million euros. So at the moment, a lot of rumors, but Inter insists they have received no big proposals for Denzel Dumfries. So I think it's a name to watch till the, till the end of the market, but timing will be really important for this story. Yeah, I mean, Manchester United would be looking at a lot of deals at the end of the market because, I mean, it's just been a very slow window for us. But moving on to outgoings, because there's some players in our squad that are looking to sell and maybe could leave before the end of the window. Eric Bailly, not on the bench yesterday. We know that he wants to move and he's been linked to Roma quite a lot. Is a sale on the cards for him or a loan or anything, anything like that? Yes, I think um, it's a serious possibility because he wants to play. He's desperate to play. He wants some game time. He tried during the preseason to show his skills. But at the same point, you know, when you have players like Lisandro, Maguire, Varane, it's going to be difficult for him to, to play. And also Lindelof when he will be back from the injury. And so at the moment, for Bedi, I see a solution on the market. Uh, Roma are interested with Jose Mourinho. So let's see if this week Roma will decide to enter into it. They, they also have other options like Zagadou of Borussia Dortmund. But Bailey could be an option for Roma and for Fulham also. So there is interest around Bailey. And I think it could be a serious option for him to, to leave May United. The only point is Roma would love a loan move for Bailey and they are waiting for May United if they will accept a loan or only permanent move for uh, for Eric Bailey. So we need to wait and see the strategy also on United side, but Roma are interested in Bailey. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? Manchester United, because the players on such high wages a lot of the time, it's hard to get them out of yes. the contract. It does end up being a loan when really we need to sell these players if they've not got a future here. And is there any other outgoings that you can see happening? Are Manchester United trying to get anybody else out the door or is it just Derek Bailly at the moment? Well, Bailly is the most uh, imminent, I would say. Then we have to say what happens with Wambisaka, for example. They are waiting for proposals for Wambisaka, but at the moment it's still interest from Crystal Palace, but then nothing else as of now. I think it's a name that we have to monitor in the, in the next days. Uh, and also Williams uh, is another player that we have to keep an eye on because 
left back situation at United with Malasia and Luke Shaw is not easy. So at the moment, this is the the general situation. But I would keep everything open for my United because, as you mentioned, it's been a slow slow window, uh, and so now they need to to act. They need to do things. I think it's really important now to do other things apart of the good ones like Ericsson and the others. But it's time to to move also on the outgoing. So I think it's going to be an important week for for my United. Thank you, Fabrizio, so much for coming on. Thank you for giving the viewers your time and thanks for all of the updates as per usual. And hopefully we'll see you on a show again soon. Thank you. Thank you. And see you again soon. Thank you. you Bye. Bye. Well, guys, that was Fritz Romano talking all the latest updates on Manchester United. And to be honest with you, I was really excited to get stuck into this show this morning because of the horror show that was yesterday. I'm sure a lot of you have seen the fan vlogs and the match vlogs. And if you've seen mine, you'll know that how disappointed I was with the result. And to be honest with you, everyone went there with higher expectations because of Ten Hag. But realistically, it's the same team playing as last year with two additions, Eriksen and Martinez, who were the better players on the pitch. I'm not saying they were perfect, but they were better players on the pitch. And a worse squad than what we went into last season with. Like Last season, we had... Pogba still, we had Greenwood still, you had more squad depth there, you had a deeper squad than what we have now. And Eric Ten Hag, realistically, is if, if he has that squad without any more signings, which is why I wanted to get Romano on here today, it is going to be a very long season for us because you can, I've said it so many times, you can't turn water into wine. It, it, Eric Ten Hag can do what he does, but he can't work magic on players. He said it himself in interviews before. So we need players in that can play to that level and have the ability to go on the pitch and play with 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 the pressure of the shirt. What I saw yesterday is in pre-season, we saw players sticking to Eric Ten Hag's plan. We saw a style of play developing. Yesterday, what we saw is as soon as there was a, a little bit of adversity, you, you could see Brighton had a very good game plan. As soon as they went up against it a little bit, reverted back to the usual, the usual stuff. And that was completely... Completely not what we were seeing in pre-season. I'm sure Eric Ten Hag would have been really frustrated. So we need players that can carry out simple instructions. We need players that can be fit enough to play the games. Again, some pe- some players yesterday, fitness wasn't up to standards. We need top, top professionals at Manchester United, which is why I wanted to get into this interview. And starting off, um, we've just got a super chat here. Please ask Fabrizio for his opinion on Manchester United board. I don't think Fabrizio would would be uh, putting that out there, to be honest with you. He's very professional and I don't think he would want to say his opinion. But if you got him in a private room or you, or you got him on his own, I'm sure he would say what everyone else is saying and what everyone knows. And that is, it's not good enough. Not an, enough money invested into the team. And to not even be in the top 10 spenders in Europe after the horrible season we had and being the, like, the biggest club in the world, I would say still the biggest club in the world. We were on the decline, but the, the biggest club in the world, it's not acceptable. And it, it really... It, it, it really isn't good enough. And seeing that result yesterday, it was going to go one or two ways. We were going to win convincingly and we would be like, Eric Ten Hag's doing really well with these players. We still need some signings, but he's looking better and the Glazers would be off the hook a little bit. Or it was going to go the other way, which which it did, and we got beat and we know that we need players in. And it's showing the fans that we can't go this transfer window without getting more people in. So we really need to build the pressure on getting... Uh, on, on, get, on getting some players in that can play these different positions. But starting off with what Romano said on Rabio, and get your opinions in the chat as well. What do you think about Rabio? What do you think of bringing him in? Because before the show, I was just speaking with my brother about it, actually. And he came to me and he said, Beth, um, really doesn't excite with this signing. He's pretty boring signing. He it doesn't, it doesn't really change anything for me. And I said, I agree with you. It's not a really exciting sign. It's not a sign and I look at and I'm like, wow, I'm so excited for him to come and play at the club. But we also said, if you look at the midfield yesterday and you look at McFred there and you look at the quality we have, is it an improvement? And it is. And it's not where you want to be if you're winning titles, but we're nowhere near at that level. We're nowhere near. We need to just be competing for top four at this point. And the performance he put in yesterday, it was like, it, it wasn't even competing for top four, top six standard. It was, it was, it was very, very poor. So we need to be getting to that level, and he is better than McFred, and that's what you've got to kind of look at. Is he one for f- the future? Probably not. Is he something that's going to really excite United fans? Probably not. But get in the comments down below what you think about him. Um, and 
Kelvin Curling says Manchester United is the most unserious team I've ever seen. Why on out of it? Why don't they go for a big player striker? Because we can't attract him. There's not many on the market and we can't we can't attract them. He, we, he's just said, Romano on the show, that Rabio isn't sure about coming to Manchester United because of no Champions League football. Champions League football is so important to a lot of players, even players that aren't at the top, top of the game. It's still important for them. If they've been playing Champions League football, it's, it's a competition they want to play in. We cannot offer that. It was We knew it was so important to get Champions League football last year. And the Glazers sat there and the board sat there in January and did nothing. They didn't buy, they didn't buy anyone. If we would have bought a midfielder or we would have given Ralph Rannick something, we could have made it into top four because everyone else performed poorly. We could have actually done that. There were so many points we dropped, which we didn't have to drop. And we said, no, we're not going to spend the money because we're going to wait to back the new manager in the summer. What have we got? It's been nowhere near enough money spent. Nowhere near. Our net spend is very, very low. I can't remember the exact figure. Someone knows it. Get it in the chat down below. But it's, it's not good enough. It's really not good enough. So we didn't get top four because we didn't spend the money. And we, the manager situation was all over the place last year. And then this year... We thought that we were going to be, this season, we thought we'd be getting money to invest and we can't actually attract the players to come because there's no Champions League football. So it's a little bit all, all over the place, to be honest with you. And each and every deal, it's like Manchester United want to do this, but they also want to do that. There's no concrete interest, really, in anyone apart from De Jong. There's no concrete, I want to go and get that player in anyone apart from De Jong. And De Jong doesn't want to come to us. So we're in a sticky situation, really. It's not been thought out. It's not been thoroughly plan this transfer window and I feel like we're going to hit panic stations in, in a few weeks and we're just going to go for whatever we can get and as Eric Ten Hag said that's not how we want to operate we want to get players in that that Eric Ten Hag wants and he likes and do you know what if Eric Ten Hag wants Arn out of it personally I'm like no I don't think it's a good option I'd rather get someone else but if he thinks it's a, it's a good option, you've got to stick with the manager and back what he wants in, in sense of things. And to be honest, he's probably quite desperate as well for someone that can is a goal scorer and can play up front and do that role. Because guys, yesterday, when we when we saw that United team without Ronaldo in it, I didn't see where a goal was coming from whatsoever. If he, Ronaldo leaves and you've got injury pro Martial, no matter how much I like Martial, it's not enough. It's really not enough. I don't see where goals are coming from, so... He probably just is desperate for a goal scorer. And talking about a goal scorer, we brought Sesco up in the conversation, a player that you know I really like and I'm really excited about and you guys really like as well, I think, in the comments. When I read the comments about Benjamin Sesco, it always seems quite positive and it always seems that people do want to get this guy in and they do want to take a risk on him. But the only negative side to Sesco is, would, would you guys accept spending because they said it's going to have to be a big bid probably around 40 million on Sesco waiting a year for him to actually come in and play to be honest with you he's pro probably not ready to start games in the Premier League yet and I would have liked him to see him developing with the five sub thing bringing him on in the Europa League group stages giving him chances there um, against European teams which is probably an easy situation for him right now I would have liked to see that but him the Salzburg saying he can only go out on loan if we do a deal this year, sell him now and come back on loan. It's it's a bit disappointing because you want him in and around the squad if you're paying that amount of money. But to be honest with you, it's a player that I really want us to get. And I feel like if we wait until next year, one, someone could buy him now and, and do that deal with the loan move. It's less likely, but it could happen. And two, if he has another good season and we don't manage to get Champions League football and we have a poor season again, more clubs are going to be interested at a higher level. He's going to pick to go to them. Again, we miss out. Sometimes when you are at this point where Manchester United are at and you're in such a low position, you have to do these sort of deals to get yourself back up there and to get yourself a kind of foothold on some good players. Sesco is going to be a very, very good player. And potentially, we might have to take a hit in the fact where he goes back on loan just to get a player in right now because we, we're not the most attractive club for, for young players to come to, especially. So... Get your thoughts in down below what you would do. To be honest with you, I would do it. If, if that was the only way we could, you could get him in, I would do it just because I think we're so desperate for a number nine to kind of take over Cristiano Ronaldo and be that number nine for Manchester United. And 
he's young he's so, it's like he's got so much potential um he's got all the attributes i think he could be a really really good player especially working under the lights of ten hag who's developed number nines in the past and it has worked so well with attacking forwards um thank you for all the super chats as well guys i'll read read them out as, as they come through i've just seen a couple come up there and yeah um hanatovic can only be a joke that's you, you think that you think that but nothing nothing is too wild for manchester united to be honest with you you know there's going to be a last minute buy in there and i wouldn't be surprised it was if it was hanatovic to be honest with you he's a good goal scorer but when I've seen him, his attitude, and, and and I feel like you talk about an outage, you like it's like I feel like I'm going six years in the past. Like it, it's not a player for the future, it's really not. But if Ten Hag wants a quick solution, you're gonna have to back him. He's clearly very desperate and he knows that he needs a goal scorer. Moving on to De Jong, because De Jong it's it's one of them where when you consistently hear on the show, he doesn't want to come. He's desperate to stay at Barcelona, who are mugging him off, completely mugging him off. He's desperate to stay at Barcelona. He doesn't want to come to Manchester United. When you hear that every time you do this interview with Romano and he knows what he's talking about, it's like, I don't really want a player coming in that desperately doesn't want to come to us and doesn't want to play for us. But with that desperate right now, and with that desperate for anyone to come in and and, and take a place in that midfield because we are so poor that we're overlooking these factors. At the end of the day, I think if Dion comes, he will be professional. He, he he will do his best. Eric Ten Hag knows his character. He wouldn't be going in for him if he thinks there'd be any sort of attitude problem whatsoever. We know Ten Hag is massively against that. So I trust in Ten Hag to make the right decision. And if he's still pushing for him, he knows that, that there's something there. When it comes to... His, te- te- his ability as a, as a player and his technicality, I have no doubt he'd be our best midfielder. He's a brilliant midfielder and I think he'd change that midfield. Do I think he's the only option? No, I think we've got so many other positions as well and on the pitch. And I think if he comes in, it doesn't solve the problems whatsoever. It gives us a better quality of midfield, but it doesn't solve the problems. But it's one of them with De Jong now. We are so desperate for a midfielder. I cannot... And I cannot go into next season watching McFred in, in the midfield. I cannot. I like McFred, I like Fred on his own, to be honest with you. As a player, I think he's improved. He didn't have the best game yesterday. But I, I like him as a player. Genuinely with McTominay, I don't see it. I don't understand what each manager is seeing. I know he's got the positive attitude. You know he's got the passion. You know he's got the mentality. We know that. But that's not enough. Genuinely, when I was watching it yesterday, I was thinking, if I'm seeing McTominay every game for the next season, we have no chance. We literally have no chance. We need a midfielder in. And it's to the point now where, of course, I want De Jong. He's my top option. Like, I think he'd be brilliant. But we need anyone better than him in that level. And I'm saying that I genuinely feel like McTominay is one of the worst midfielders in the league. Like, when I've, I watch him every single week and I don't know what play... I would, managers are obviously seeing something. I don't know if it's in training because he is consistently getting picked. But then also you look back and you think, what are the other options? There's not really any apart from youth players and Garner who's trying to progress. So you need to give Eric Ten Hag them, them options. You need to give him a chance to kind of pick other people and, and, and see what they're about and how they how they connect the team. Because even yesterday when people are blaming the defence, I was like, the reason the defence is, is is getting cut open a lot of the time is because we have absolutely no midfield. We go up the pitch and it takes us ages to break down the opposition because everyone's focused, everyone's in the right position and, and, and they've got a game plan and they're sticking to it and the players are, are good. Like, you look at the midfield of every Premier League team and you look at McFred, there is even nothing between them or the other team is better. And that's not good enough for a, for a team that's trying to push. So when you look at that, it takes us so long to break down. As soon as they come up the other way, no one's in the correct position and they go straight through us and straight to the defence. So we need we need a midfield in there. And it's looking like if you can't get De Jong, I would seriously consider getting other options in now at this point in the transfer window because you just cannot afford to go into internet season with the midfield we've currently got. And it's like, honestly, if we were run like a football club and a club that wanted to win things and, and was ambitious, we've got the money there. We we make the money as fans every year. 
I would be getting a De Jong alternative and still pushing for De Jong because two would not hurt. We need to. People are settling for one because we know we're not going to get two. But if we get a De Jong alternative and then manage to get De Jong over the line, great, we've got two options. So that's what I'd be doing. It's never going to happen because Manchester United aren't working like that. They'll want to save money whereas, wherever possible. But that, I, I honestly would be doing that if, if I was Manchester United right now in this situation. Um, Sesco will be a good sign-in, um, but there are better young players than Sesco. Well, get, get them in the chat down below if you think there's better young players. And to be honest with you, it's Eric Ten Hag clearly goes give this a thumbs up. So if, if he wants him, then you've got to support that. Um, and I think Sesco is a very, very, very good young player, for, honestly. Um, Professor says, this team will not finish top six if McFred plays. I mean, it's not all on McFred. They're a big issue. We've also got issues everywhere else on the pitch as well. But it's a, it's a, it's a big one. It's a big one. If we had a completely different midfield in that team, you see different results. Um, and I agree with you. If we keep McFred, I'd... I worry. I worry for the season. I really do. And I worry about what position we are finishing. Because as we said, every other team strengthening, every other team, um, they've got game plans to combat our strengths. And it's it's not their fault. They are just not good enough as players. Um, I mean, look at Andreas Pereira for Fulham. He left and balled out for Fulham in, in his first game. And it's like, we were all criticising Pereira, and rightly so. He wasn't good enough when he played first-team football for Manchester United. We all knew he was pre-season Perlo. But when he played first-team football, he could be a player where the pressure of the shirt gets to you. He's gone to Fulham, and he looks very, very good. So how often do you see players leaving, and then they look so much better? We've gone through manager after manager. Is it something toxic inside the club? Is it the fact they just can't handle the pressure of playing for the shirt? I honestly think... You've got to be a certain type of player to play at Old Trafford with that shirt on and and, and, and still and, and it not affect you. They're the players that we need to get in, people with the right mentality. So that's a big factor of what we need to look at as well. Um, sign Tillemans, well, he's a player that we could be going to, it could be going for, but again, we're not. We're waiting for De Jong, but it might not happen. And Arsenal might end up with Tillemans. We end up with a last-minute panic buy on, on nothing at all, to be honest with you. So it's, it's something we've got to look at. Super chatting from Mojo saying, the situation yesterday made two things clear. Only Frankie de Jong signing will not happen, will, will not solve the problem. And two, I hope Eric Ten Hag now realises that his statement about the team finishing second was misplaced and he has seen the shock reality now. To be honest with you, I think him saying about the team finishing second, the amount it was repeated, he's been told he has to do a job with these players and he's going to get some backing, but he's got to improve the players we've got. So I think he was trying to motivate the players we had to give them confidence and and he knows he's going to have to work with them. But at the same time, he's, he's a very intelligent manager. He knows he needs players. He knows these players' strengths and weaknesses. I think he's going to have a shock at how strong the Premier League actually is when it comes to each team genuinely having the capability to to, to beat you quite, um, not only to beat you, but to bat you as well. Like there is there is that capability in the Premier League with different teams and the squad we've got. So hopefully he goes knocking onto the board and saying, look, I know, you, I know we said we'd wait for De Jong. I know you said we'd wait for the right player, but did you see what happened yesterday? If you want me to do anything this season, I need some money. And it, and it, will, re, it will pay itself off because... I'll be able to get better results with this team and, and the fans will be happier, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, a lot of the time we know this football club, potentially they're just thinking about saving as much money as possible. And they probably still think we'll finish top four, which is crazy to think. They'll have looked at pre-season and probably think, wow, we're, we're going to do well this season with the team we've got. We've done it, guys. We've got a manager and we've not spent much money, but, but we're going to do well. Look at, look at this manager. Look how we've done in pre-season. Oh my God, Martial is like a new signing for us. But realistically... That you've not, you're not a foot. They're not footballing people. They don't know the, the, the dynamics of it. They don't know the the difference of it. And they thought we were going to be able to breeze by to top four last year when they brought Randnick in and give him no money. It didn't happen. You've got to learn from mistakes in the past. And um, David Sherwin, we should have got Skamaka. At this point, genuinely, you look at any striker and you start thinking we should have done this, we should have done that. But you want players that are good enough to play um, first team football for Manchester United, are good enough to progress. 
But at the same time, with the players we look, look like we're going for now, you think, wow, we should have gone for that player. It's As fans, we have high standards and we think we want to go for the players we know that have the potential to be in a, a Premier League winning side or, or compete for Champions Leagues or compete at the highest level. But sometimes you've got to make those little progression steps. And that's what Manchester United are probably thinking about now. At the end of the day, this team is so, so, so far off the top. Maybe you just make them progression to players that can get top four. And it's like, Newcastle, I'm not comparing us to Newcastle, but Newcastle straight away, when when the, everyone thought they were going to sign like really big players, and I knew that wasn't going to happen because the attraction isn't quite there for them yet. They've not moved up the table high enough. They're not playing your, any European football or anything like that. But when you look at Newcastle, you thought they were going to make these big, big money signings. Eddie Howe, what he did is he got players in that aren't world beaters, but are better than what was already there. And I'm not saying we have to do that, but the fact we're talking about, talking about us in the same sentence as Newcastle, it, it's how far we, we have gone off. And I've looked at it now and I'm thinking, at this point in time, I do want players that are going to be at the top level. I do want players that can compete at the highest level. But at the same time, the team is so bad. We need just a platform to move up. And if we get players in, such as a Rabio, who no one's excited about, no one thinks he's going to be able to play in Premier League winning teams, but he's better than what we've already got. And it gives us more chance of getting into the top four, which gives us more chance of attracting other players. Sometimes you've got to start from the bottom and work your way up. And the players that we're getting linked to now, with the, the talk coming out about us trying to go for players and them not really being interested because we don't have Champions League football. It's worrying. It's very worrying. And we need to do something before the midfield, before the midfield, before the transfer window closes. But at the same time, you advocate for not doing panic buys and you advocate for not just panicking and buying players. But it, 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 it just shows how ill thought out this transfer window was. And realistically, there was no plan or direction apart from go and get Nunes. It didn't happen. We were stuck for options for, for months. You didn't hear a striker option come out of Manchester United. There was no clearly no other option that Ten Hag wanted to go with. We said go for De Jong. That's still ongoing. Nothing else has really been planned out whatsoever. And even that was a last-minute decision. So there should have been other players there waiting. We should have had other midfielders lined up, honestly. So it's just it's just a frustrating time to be a, a United fan. When you see performances like that, you're excited for the new season. You want to you wanna be able to bring signings in. And when they don't look like they're happening, it is disappointing. Um, Jevon Bagalou says, what about James Orpals, Ruben Neves, uh, Shea Adams, Ivan Tony? Honestly, all good players. And I'd, not good enough to play for Manchester United, in my opinion. Um, I think James ward Prowse is a great player. but And I think he could he's definitely a player that could play for us. And people would say no, but when you look at the likes of Fred and McTominay, and you look at James Ward-Prowse, he's better. Um, Ruben Neves, another player that could play for us. Shea Adams, for me, he, I don't think he's going to ever reach that top level. Ivan Tony, I really like, and not a lot of people agree with me. But again, he will cost a lot to get out of Brentford, and it doesn't seem like we're interested. So I don't know. There is players you've got to consider that previously you would have laughed at and be like, no, they're not good enough. But when you look at who we're attracting and, and the deals we're doing... You've got, you've got to start looking at it in a way where we, we need improvements massively. But thank you, guys, for getting involved in the chat. Thanks for listening to the interview. I appreciate all the positive feedback. I appreciate the fact that we're all in this together and that we all feel the same disappointment. We got some good stuff from Romano there regarding Rabio and out of it, Sesco. And, and a little news on Ronaldo as well. With Ronaldo, before I get off and, and, and you guys um, get in the chat below what your opinions are. I think he's going to stay at Manchester United. From what Romano said, he basically said, he's got no options, but don't rule it out because Mendes is a super agent that can do anything. So at the moment, Ronaldo's a top professional. There's nothing on the table. There's only three weeks left. I think he's staying at Manchester United, which is a big plus for us because even though we he didn't score yesterday when he came on, it, we just looked more likely to score. Um, but he's a because he's a striker and he's and if you give him the service he will score goals. I'm excited to see him and Ericsson together. That's the only positive I could really take. And lastly, before I get off, I'll just read this last super chat. Cobalt Ray, maybe we sign Pau Torres and move Lissandro Martinez to CDM. We can get Andrea Bellotti for free instead of signing Arnautovic. Not going to happen. He wants him to play left sided centre back. 
And it, the, I was at the point yesterday where I was like, well, Martinez would definitely be better in the midfield than McTominay and Fred. So um, if you could move into two positions, then you would. But Eric Ten Hag wants to play him as a left-sided centre-back. So that's where he's going to play. Liverpool, 4-0, United. Oh, God, don't. Liverpool games coming up. Can you get signings in through the door and, and get him up to speed in time for that? I mean, I hope so, because that's going to be a tough one to watch. But get in the comments down below. If you're Manchester United now, you've got three weeks left, you've just seen that game, what are you doing? What are you doing to fix this problem? Do you, you get excited about Rabiot? Do you think it's a bad deal? Do you think Ronaldo will stay? Do you think we'll end up getting De Jong? What would you do about the Sesco situation? Would you get him and then loan him back out? Or would you just avoid it and because you think it's too much money? Get in your guys' comments down below. I'll read them. I'll reply to them. Make sure you like and subscribe. And we've got a 2pm show coming up. So we'll see you on the